Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn about the St. Louis Welcome Fund. We are going to get started here in just a few minutes. We had about 45 people register for this and we have about half the attendees. So um, if you could be patient with us here, we'll give people a little bit more time to log in and so we can start our conversation. All right, well, we will get started. It's 8.03 now by my clock and we have introductions. So with that, I'll start with myself. I am Neosha Franklin. I'm the Director of Communications at the St. Louis Community Foundation. And I will be helping to monitor the panel along with my colleague, Emily Bauman, who is the Communications Associate as well, who will also be helping to monitor today's panel. I'm really excited to have our panelists here today to walk us through and give us more information about the St. Louis Welcome Fund, which kind of started here um, within the last year or so. So I'll start off with bios for um, all of our panelists and then we'll kind of get going into some introductory questions. So we'll start off with um, Betsy Cohen. Betsy Cohen is the executive director for the St. Louis Mosaic Project. The St. Louis Mosaic Project works with hundreds of regional partners who deliver deep services to immigrants and refugees. This initiative started in 2013 and is a joint collaboration of the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership and leaders of 32 organizations. Mosaic works to attract foreign born of all ethnicities and skills and helps them to connect to social family and professional services for their success in the St. Louis region. Welcome Betsy. We also have Ben Zeno, who currently works at the Missouri Foundation for Health as a strategist supporting the elimination of health inequities throughout Missouri. In his prior role, he helped to launch and grow the Mental Health Collaborative at Casa de Salud. Ben has collaborated with a diverse team of organizations to ensure access to quality mental health care for Casa patients, mostly Spanish-speaking immigrants in the St. Louis region. During his tenure, the collaborative quickly grew from four to 18 partners, and Ben came to St. Louis from Seattle to study Latin American studies and chemistry at Washington University. And Elizabeth George. Elizabeth joined the St. Louis Community Foundation in 2018 with over 20 years of strategic planning, organizational assessment, facilitation, and board development experience in the philanthropic sector. Elizabeth provides strategic advice and counsel to the foundation's private foundation clients and largest donor funds, as well as special grant programs such as the COVID-19 Regional Response Fund, the Bridgeton Landfill Community Project Fund, and the St. Louis Welcome Fund. Elizabeth also represents the Community Foundation on a variety of community-based initiatives. So welcome to all of our speakers. We're really excited to have you and thank you for taking the time um, out of your morning to join us. So let's, we're gonna set the stage and get started and we're gonna start this panel off with kind of going through some background information about the, about the fund and how it got started. And so we're gonna start with Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, if you could tell us a little bit about the St. Louis Welcome Fund and the role the St. Louis Community Foundation plays. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> There we go. So I'll start, I'll try again. I was just gonna say thank you so much to Neosha and um, to Betsy and Ben for, for joining um, us today. It, it's just really wonderful to have both of you and your perspectives um, as we talk about the St. Louis Welcome Fund. So I wanna start with a little background here. Um, 
the St. Louis Welcome Fund really came out of a group of funders coming together in late August, early September, when the news of, well, with the fall of Kabul, and then the news of the number of Afghans that could potentially end up here in St. Louis. At one point, we thought as many as 1,500 Afghans could be coming to, to St. Louis. And as we came together to, to think about what kind of philanthropic response should, should, we, should we plan for with this influx, what we realized is it's not just the Afghans coming into St. Louis that we need to plan for. We also need to think about all the other refugees that are coming through the refugee resettlement system and or um, asylum seekers that are coming into the country, settling in, in St. Louis and um, looking to our community for safety for protection um, as they left their homes. So anyway, the more we learned, the more we came together, the more we heard about how the um, refugee resettlement system had really been decimated over the last four to six years um, with, with the reduction in the number of, um, of refugees that were coming, that were allowed into the country over the last, um, or, or with the last administration. So what we, what we heard was that we really need to rebuild. We need to start by making sure the services are available and then we need to really think about, um, about rebuilding the system. And that is really the birth of the St. Louis Welcome Fund. So, okay, let me get back to the right screen to change my slides here problem with too many screens, right? Um, okay, there we go. So so when we pulled together, we and and I'll let you read the fund purpose, but what what we know when we you pull together a pooled fund is that you have to have that clearly stated and understood shared purpose. And, and I have to say that was a little tricky for us, for this group of funders that came together because we had some that really wanted to focus just on the Afghans, just on the refugees coming through the official refugee resettlement process. And we had others that were saying, well, look at, we've got people here who've been here for a long time that are trying to find their way and we really need to be serving them as well. And here's what we finally did settle on as our fund purpose, that we're funding the organizations that serve refugees and asylum seekers. And we want to expand opportunities for funding for these same folks. We wanna focus on the first year of their time in St. Louis as, as getting them settled in that first year really sets them on that path for success. We want the general, community to understand what St. Louis's role as a resettlement city is. And we want to rebuild that refugee resettlement system after these years of disinvestment. And, and I wanna pause here for just a quick second because one of the learnings that we had were for those of us who weren't steeped in this work. And we have a few of the institution funders that, that do a lot of work in this area. But for those of us that weren't, we, we learned about these really specific legal definitions around words like refugees or humanitarian parolees or special immigrant visas or asylum seekers. There are very specific legal definitions. And our focus on refugees and asylum seekers was steeped in those, those definitions. Um, whoops, went back. There we go. So these are our collective commitments. Um, and, and along with our shared purpose, we also needed to know how we were going to work together. And so you can think of these as sort of guiding principles. Um, what we'd like to say is that we brilliantly crafted these for this, this fund. But in reality, we took these guiding principles from the St. Louis Census 2020 fund and adapted them for the Welcome Fund to really focus in on the immigrants, or I'm sorry, refugees and asylum seekers. And, you know, and they hold pretty true. And, and I am personally a sucker for value statements and that kind of thing. 
And so this is really important to me. And over the course, you know, since November, when we really pulled together the Welcome Fund, I have come back, I have looked at these, and I've tried to make sure that the work that we're doing really does live up to these collective commitments. And then you can see our current funding partners. There are 10 foundations that came together for the Welcome Fund. Um, we started out with about 25-ish, including some corporate funders that, um, that were at the table originally. And some came off because really what they wanted was the learning. Others were doing their own um, giving in this area and um, and that's all good. But these are the 10 that really came, that, that said, yes, we are committing to the fund. And we have had some of our donors that have contributed as well. And for those of you, if you're on the, on the uh, call, we really thank you for that. Um, so let's see. So the fund operations, it is held here at the St. Louis Community Foundation and it's governed by an oversight committee. And the oversight committee is any and anyone who provided $5,000 or more to the fund has the option of sitting on the oversight committee, not required. And, um, and that's how we've got a nine out of the 10 that have been pretty active um, in the fund, in the oversight committee. Um, our funding priorities were determined through our ongoing conversations throughout the fall and, and winter with service providers. And then we chose to use a streamlined application process. What we wanted to do was make this easy for the nonprofits. They've got a lot on their plates. Let's, let's do what we can to get these dollars out to them. Um, and because we'd been in conversation over the, over the last six months, we were able to target um, nonprofits that met the criteria we had set out. We used a short proposal and we're going to use trust-based philanthropy for our reporting back. So that's more conversational. Um, we will ask for a budget. We will ask for how many people they served, but it's really much more conversational than a long um, federal grant report kind of thing. So, and if we have enough funding, our future rounds are going to focus on um, our first round of grants, uh, we solicited proposals from 14 nonprofit organizations. The committee met um, just last week to review those proposals, and we'll be announcing grants um, next week, which we're very, very excited about. Okay, so I, oh, and let me go back to that. I do want to give a special shout out to the community investment team here at the St. Louis Community Foundation, as they've really worked hard um, to, to make this grant, um, the, the Welcome Fund, a reality. So special <laughs> thanks to Vicki and Emily Seifel. So I think I'm going to stop sharing for now and turn it back over to you, Neosha. Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that background. And so we're going to move on to talk about a little bit about the refugee process. And so, Betsy, I know that you've had a lot of experience in this area um, and a lot of knowledge. So can you talk to us a little bit about the process and how this process differs from um, for Afghans who arrived here after the fall of Cabal? Great. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, as Elizabeth said, the term refugee is a very specific term. And uh, for the United States, the typical refugee process is one that goes from the United Nations identifying people who are classified as refugees, who then are distributed among nine national U.S. organizations, who then distribute these cases and families to organizations in St. Louis, the only organization that receives refugees through the official refugee resettlement program is the International Institute. And when these refugees come here, they come with certain, um, a little bit of money that they and the Institute have to get them started in their first 90 to 180 days. They also have the ability to stay in this country. And that is from the start. With the Afghans, it was a different process because this was um, a, a military operation of our United States. And it had to do with our foreign policy and our commitments to help people who have helped us. And so that was an evacuation um, that brought people who worked with our military as well as others who worked with nonprofits and other organizations to stabilize Afghanistan and their extended family members. So when these individuals came to our country, they technically 
um, do not hold the name refugees. So our country, they, they have different visas, different funding, different statuses. So some of them came on special immigrant visas that allow them to stay in this country. Uh, some of them came as uh, humanitarian parolees um, because they did not exactly qualify for the special immigrant visa with our military forces. And the unfortunate aspect is right now in our legal system, those people, uh, theoretically, if they don't get asylum status, they would be deported or subject to deportation um, after the two years that they've been here, which would be crazy that we have brought them here and then subject them to deportation. So the Afghans came with a, a range of statuses. Some had different funding through the International Institute, some did not. And some have had other abilities to get uh, legal documents, to work authorization. They also came very quickly. Typically, the refugee process can take multiple years through the United Nations and then through a 13-step vetting process through the American State Department. And what happened here was um, our country took 70,000 very quickly. And so when our International Institute um, has received a little over 600 people, it all happened in a very short several months, which was a stress and a strain on a network that was um, had been somewhat inactive over the past uh, several years due to administration and the pandemic. So you mentioned the International Institute of St. Louis um, as our region's refugee resettlement agency, and therefore is one of the key service providers for the refugees when they arrive. Can you talk to us about you know, what does it really mean for an organization to be a refugees resettlement agency and specifically their role once those individuals get to the, get to the country? So when they arrive, so the International Institute, um, again, I work for the St. Louis Economic Development Partnership to attract people. I do not work at the International Institute. Sometimes people are confused because we collaborate on a daily basis. Um, the International Institute um, is a large organization that is a full service a social service agency that does not only for refugees, but for up to 6,000 foreign born people a year, they provide services, but that includes loans, it includes English, it includes computers, it includes workforce. Um, for refugees, they have a special division. And what that division for refugee resettlement, and again, I will mention in the past, Catholic Charities, Jewish Federation had been involved in refugee resettlement, but as of, um, a number of years, only the International Institute has been our resettlement agency for our region and has done a phenomenal job. So they actually meet those families at the airport at all hours of the day or night with often maybe two days notice about who would be arriving and how many people. They meet them at the airport. Um, if they have enough lead time, they get them into an apartment or a house that they can be in that this limited funding from our government um, will allow them to be in or potentially they end up going to an extended stay hotel for several days or in the case of really almost 78 to 100 right today, they are still in extended stay hotels because they have large families and the Institute has not been able to find the right housing for them. So the Institute um, essentially has funding to help them for their first 90 days and for some programs, the Institute can continue to help them with some of their programs for the additional 90 days and for certain programs over a year. But often their main goal is that first 90 days to 180 days to get them into an apartment. The apartment has to be set up in advance so that it's got a bed and a chair and a table. There's food in the refrigerator. The first day the refugee family or these Afghan families are here, someone from the Institute sees them. They take them to a grocery store. They show them with volunteers and thousands of volunteers, how to get on the bus. Those individuals have to start going to the International Institute for English assessment, for health, for job, for workforce. So it's an intensive process that the International Institute has case workers who work with them on a range of their needs from mental, physical, education, how to get the kids enrolled in schools. And all of this will depend on where that apartment is that people have been located into. So it's an incredible service and the Institute has been the lead agency for the Afghans because it happened so quickly. They also pulled in many community partners, Oasis, Welcome Neighbor, and there's been a collaboration. There's been an every Wednesday call, they have a command center and they have truly mobilized the region with um, many partners to very quickly get this 650 Afghan people 
connected to um, their starting success in St. Louis. Fantastic. And so, you know, they are the key individual or the key organization that when they first arrive here. And so from your vantage point, um, how does their role, the International Institute's role differ from other nonprofits in the community? And, you know, where does the International Institute leave off and others pick up? So it seems like there's a, a synergy of services that are happening. International T Institute has very key, key and prominent roles, but can you talk a little bit about how other agencies might come together and partner? You kind of alluded to that in your last response. Yeah, so there are some agencies that helped right from the start with uh, surrounding these families with uh, volunteers who could help them learn the bus or how to go to the grocery store, help them with schooling, um, getting kids enrolled. But many of the uh, services of the um, International Institute do continue for the first year, um, but not at the same level. And then there are many other services that they do not provide, cannot provide, that many of the community partners need to step up and do. And though that involves um, longer term housing, it involves legal issues. So for example, many of these individuals are going to need legal assistance to help with um, asylum applications because our government has not determined um, how to uh, pass legislation for them to stay. There are many mental health, physical health needs that players like Casa de Salud step in with uh, because it's hard for these individuals to get healthcare right from the beginning. Um, issues for their schooling, education, language, housing. Um, some of the initial housing um, only gives them um, a number of months and ability for them to have other resources for transport and housing are extended. Language skills, um, everything cannot be solved at the agency and definitely workforce issues. And we can come back to that later, but helping people get started into their jobs does get started at the International Institute, but that's something that many other partners can help with. Thank you, Betsy, that's great. So speaking of other partners, I would love to invite Ben to go ahead and come off of mute. Uh, we know that Missouri Foundation for Health is one of the largest health funders in the region. Ben, could you tell us a little bit more about Missouri Foundation for Health's role and partnership with the Welcome Fund and what made your organization decide to join the Welcome Fund? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, y'all. Uh, so Missouri Foundation for Health's mission is to eliminate the underlying causes of health inequities, transform systems, and enable individuals and communities to thrive. We've always had a strong racial equity focus as we look at health inequities, um, and immigrants you know, are often one of the, the demographic groups we focus on. Most recently, our sort of responsive grant making to try and um, be as nimble and responsive to emerging circumstances as we can. Uh, one of our, our main way of doing that, we targeted immigrants uh, services with that as recently as um, last winter. So it's, our, it's on our minds, uh, it's in our funding priorities. Uh, and when we see the chance to work with other funders in this region, send a unified, strong and inclusive signal uh, from the funder community and to the nonprofit community to let them know that they have support and obviously by extension, um, new arrivals, new members of our community uh, know that they have support. We obviously want to lend our resources and, you know, whatever else we can do. Um, and in my case, uh, it was sort of brought up in my bio, but I'm pretty new to the philanthropy world. I've spent the bulk of my uh, time in St. Louis working on, actually like with directly uh, doing services or running programs that work with Spanish speaking immigrants. So I was happy to, um, kind of lend some of my on the ground experience to our deliberations about who to fund. That must've been an amazing experience. So I feel like you've talked a little bit about um, the greatest immediate needs that the fund is addressing, but what are your opinions on long-term needs that the fund could address or that you just see in the future as a need? Well, I, I do wanna highlight that we did sort of hone in on specific immediate needs. so. We looked at you know, basic case management, housing, uh, and housing through that, legal needs and mental health needs. Again, some of that was informed by talking to partners. It also jives with what I had seen as sort of the immediate needs that people have. Long-term, I think a lot of what this operational support does uh, is give some folks breathing room to strategize and work smart, uh, not just overtime and hard, uh, as they're working to build capacity, scale back up to meet 
um, more new arrivals coming for for the foreseeable future. Um, from my experience, you know, uh, even you know, I remember talking to one of the nonprofits um, that we were looking at funding, and they were saying if we could just get some breathing room, we could actually work to fundraise and we could work to you know hire the right people. But as is, we're just sort of stuck in reactive mode. Um, so I think that's huge. I think it allows us to those organizations to, like I said, build smart, build that capacity in an intentional way, build stronger connections with each other so they don't have to duplicate services or reinvent the wheel um, and, you know, hopefully invest in some networking places for them to, to do that um, and also build those external connections, for example, with uh, landlords and, you know, to help people have more pathways to housing when they first arrive. And then last thing I would say is we hope uh, our fund our, our, we were interested in organizations that were connected with the broader system, not just this sort of separate immigrant service system. So for example, there's a nonprofit that stepped up and worked with the state to translate the driver's test into Dari right away. They didn't have any funding or additional resources. They just did it. That type of work is really necessary because you can't only meet the needs of people through this separate through the nonprofit world, right? People need to get a driver's license. So uh, hopefully, you know, we have organizations that are plugged into that as well. And that's a huge part of the long-term game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You've all talked about how housing seems to be one of the biggest challenges faced by refugees at this time. How is the refugee serving community addressing that challenge and how can funders help? Well, I will step in. I mean, this this has been um, one of the goals of this new fund that the International Institute has put together with Jerry Schlichter and some other leaders in the community to get more money into a housing fund. Because typically when the government gives this small stipend to the International Institute, um, it really allows kind of 90 to 180 days potentially of housing, um, a small amount per person. And many landlords don't want to make a contract for 90 days, not knowing if that family is then going to leave because the family is not committed. And, and it, there's a good reason the International Institute cannot sign uh, for a commitment for a family that doesn't know where they want to live. So the Institute you know, only is going to sign for 90 days or they have some funds to extend it. Um, but this new um, secondary migration fund, and we can talk about that, is allows an additional $500,000 that the Institute has to help um, promised landlords that they could have a year lease um, if needed. So I think both for the uh, first group that are here from the Afghans and for other migrant um, people who have come and asylum seekers, having a housing fund is really important so that people can get started because that is critical for them to get their children enrolled in school, to start um, their workplace, uh, figuring out transportation, whether it's going to be the bus or a car. But if you don't get your housing settled, you just can't get your life in order. Betsy, yeah. I know secondary migration is a little bit of a new term to me. It might be a new term for some others on this call. Could you just go over what secondary migration means in this context? Um, yes, what it means is that um, whether it's through the official refugee program or other ways that individuals come and arrive in our community, uh, we as a region wanna be a welcoming region and wanna grow. We, we've seen the population numbers for our region are, are declining. And, we wanna be a growing region. So we want to attract more people. Um, when someone comes to our country, that is really their first migration. Secondary migration means that people come to the United States and once they come, they are, I guess like Southwest Airlines says, they're free to move about the cabin. Um, so once a refugee resettlement has brought someone to St. Louis and they've completed that 90 to 180 days, if they hear from someone that, you know, jobs are better somewhere else, they can pick up and leave. The same way if people hear that St. Louis is welcoming and people are finding jobs and housing is reasonable and the community is welcoming, then people, Afghans from other places where it's so expensive in California um, and they can't find a job in Texas and Chicago is really cold and they'd like to go somewhere warmer and they hear that St. Louis is welcoming and people are getting jobs and the kids are getting in school, then they become a secondary migration and they come here. So the question is, this is something that we did experience with the Bosnians in the 1990s and the International Institute um, really is a great case study of that where um, thousands um, over a few years, um, you know, close to 15,000, between 10 and 15,000 
Bosnians came here, but then other Bosnians from around the country came here as well. And so then they came and then they married, they had children and grandchildren. So we have a Bosnian community that you might be 40 or 50,000 because we had primary and then secondary migration. So the goal here is how do we become a region that is secondary migration attractive for the Afghans that have come to our country? And that is why this fund of a million three has been put together um, through the International Institute and it's in place now. And so there's a housing fund. There is money for three staff people of which they've already hired one to work with the Afghan community. They're going to be starting an Afghan Chamber of Commerce, an Afghan Community Center, an Afghan digital newspaper, iPads, some training, some technology training, a soccer field, um, some soccer um, opportunities for the children. And truly, it's a way to say we want to be welcoming. And I think um, this is what secondary migration means. And with a concerted effort and follow on fund from this welcome fund, it shows, and we put this on LinkedIn, that St. Louis is serious about helping people be successful in St. Louis for the long term. And so if you come here, even if it wasn't your first stop, you will be welcomed and you will be successful. Great, thank you for that insight, Betsy. I'm sorry if I cut you off, Ben. Was there something you'd like to add? No, it's all good. Okay. I'm happy to, I'll work it into my remarks later. <laughs> all right. Well, switching gears a little bit, Ben, I would actually like to come back to you. Thinking back to how Elizabeth was talking about the funding process for the St. Louis Welcome Fund, and we've talked about immediate and long-term needs for refugee families and then nonprofits that are supporting them. Could you tell us a little bit more about the selection process for the funding? Absolutely. So, and that'll tie in with what I was trying to say earlier. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so um, there are two big priorities here, uh, which Elizabeth already mentioned. One is we wanted to be quick and responsive. And two, we wanted this to be easy for nonprofits. They're already working uh, many hours. They don't need to write a 10-page application, especially because a lot of the funders brought expertise about this immigrant service world and already knew you know the landscape pretty well um, and you know we know and trust a lot of these organizations so why make them jump through a bunch of hoops um, so based on the expertise at the table um, the foundations where this is one of their core funding areas as well as some of us like myself who just sort of you know have been working in that area for a while we came up with a long list of organizations that work with immigrants refugees new arrivals um, when after being on say weekly briefing calls with the International Institute, read it, you know, kind of everyone's been taking the pulse quite often. We're able to narrow down on those three priorities I mentioned earlier, which were housing, legal assistance, in part because of that precarious legal status that Betsy was talking about, right? Some of these folks might have to apply for asylum in the next year, we don't know. Uh, and then mental health needs as well, because we obviously understand uh, what a traumatizing experience it is to have to leave your country in the sort of chaotic situation that the Afghans did, or, or which honestly any other refugee is coming has uh, some some quite uh, horrific stories, most likely. So um, from there, we we're able to take that long list, make it to a short list, because not all those organizations touch on one of those three areas. Some you know worked on multiple. Uh, and then we fanned out and did phone calls with people. Again, the idea of being a phone call is a little bit easier and less and more informal, less stressful than a formal application. That was an information gathering and to sort of confirm that uh, everything is so fast moving in this, in this world. And especially um, right now with all the new people coming and organizations trying to scale up uh, that we wanted to make sure that stuff was still the same as it was even a month or two ago um, at that time. So talking to the organizations, we were finding out, you know, what could they do with resources? What were they seeing right now? Who are they working with to see if we didn't have any blind spots on that long list that we came up with to start? Um, and then, yeah, so it's sort of checking some of our assumptions. So for example, I wanted to bring this up with housing. We initially thought that we would fund more direct rent or utility assistance, um, that, that was that was sort of the gap that we could fill. And then, you know, given some of the stuff, the initiatives that were going on that Betsy mentioned and talking to the nonprofits, uh, we found out that the best way to address housing was actually via sort of basic needs case management. Um, because, you know, now there was some of the financial resources to um, sort of uh, back the leases or, you know, pay first and last month's rent, things like that but uh, people had a hard time finding the houses, so they needed case managers. So that did uh, was one of the biggest ways that those calls informed uh, what we funded. 
From there, we had a short application. I believe the turnaround time was about two weeks, but it was very quick and streamlined. And again, we had prepared the nonprofits. They knew what we were thinking about. Um, and uh, with those phone calls, we then uh, in about a week uh, read and reviewed those. Uh, so again, quick turnaround um, and came to consensus as a group, which is quite challenging with 10 people, but we did it um, and uh, decided sort of dollar amounts in which organizations we would fund. And we had community representation, pardon me, on that, um, on that meeting as well, which was very helpful. So uh, I can't, I wish I could say more details because we'll be, we'll be official and public next week. Uh, but uh, you know, it's an exciting group and, and jives very well with sort of my experience before working in philanthropy on who's really on the front lines doing great work. So yeah, that was the process. Thank you, that's awesome. Elizabeth, I know that you, among many other people, have been part of the grant making committee. We know that the Welcome Fund is committed to transparent and equitable grant making in this process. Is there anything you'd like to add about the grant making committee? You know, I want to echo um, what Ben said about the fact that you know we 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 worked hard to get to consensus, and that is not an easy process. And it's a process you know, we. I have um, I always joke about on my computer. I've got a little sticky that says collaboration happens at the speed of trust, and that that we needed that time from November until you know February to to be able to get to where we were, um, where the oversight committee had clear direction as to what they were doing, and where we were going. And, and that was really important. Um, and as Ben said, the community representation um, kind of, we, we wanted some, we wanted to have somebody on the oversight committee who had um, the experience of coming to the United States, preferably as a refugee, and um, yet wasn't tied to any one of the organizations that we might be funding. And that, that took us a little more time than, than we anticipated. And when we found that person, um, Polly Rijos, um, it, she was fantastic, just really brought um, good questions, sometimes having people who are outside the you know, institutional fund foundation kinds of things, um, they could bring up some realities and some questions that we wouldn't have otherwise thought about. So, mm -hmm. so it was a good process. It was a great process. And um, it's a process that we hope will continue. Great, thank you for that insight. Um... Our next topic actually relates to a question that we had in the chat. We know that there's a lot of questions just in general about Ukraine and if there will be a mass resettlement in our region. What can you tell us about this? I know that that's, that's a big question, but and any it, thoughts? It's an incredibly fluid question. So, um, and, and Betsy, jump in here with me at any point. If, I, if you had asked me this one week ago today, I would have said at this point, there is no statement from um, the federal government, from the White House, that we would become an official refugee country, that we would be doing any re um, refugee resettlement for Ukrainians. Um, generally, as Betsy outlined, you know, the UN High Commission on Refugees starts to determine where people are going to go. And they use, you know, their first process is to try to get people home, back into their own homes, that, they're, that peace can occur at home. Um, and then it, the second is to try to get people to stay where they are. Well, we know that countries like Poland and Lithuania can't handle all of the Ukrainians that are coming in. And then they will take people out to, um, to a resettlement country. And as Betsy said, that can be an 18 month to three year process. Um, Afghanistan was unique because of the unique circumstances of our country being there for 20 years and then pulling out relatively mm. quickly. So, um, so Thursday, the White House said, we'll bring in 100,000 Ukrainians, but they didn't say when, they didn't say how, and they didn't say whether they would be coming through um, the regular refugee um, process. So we really don't have a lot of good information. What we do know is that Ukrainians that are already in the country on temporary visas, so students or tourists, whatever, they have been given what, what is called temporary protective status, meaning that they can stay in the U.S. without um, 
without being sent home until further notice. Now, until further notice could be in two weeks, it could be in two years, it could be in 10 years. Um, it's just, we don't know. Um, Ukrainians that are already here in the US can bring family members over. So if you've got a family member that is um, in Poland and you can figure out how to get them to, you know, into the country, then you can bring them over. I think you have to apply for that. Betsy might be able to, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we also know that there are Ukrainians on our southern border who are coming in um, undocumented. So it's, it's fluid. It's a process. We're going to learn more as the, as the White House tells us more about what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and how they're going to do it. What I would say is this fund, the Welcome Fund, is for um, any refugee or, or person looking for asylum in the US. Um, so that will include Ukrainians. That, um, that already is including Ukrainians. Uh, we just don't know what that will look like. And um, you know, Ben mentioned the, that we all read the applications. And in the proposals in this first round of funding, we did see people who, um, or, or nonprofits that were saying, we're getting ready for the Ukrainians. We know they're coming. And so, so um, it's, it's on everybody's radar screen, but there's no easy answer. Speaking of it being on everybody's radar, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on this. What are ways that our community can get involved in the settlement efforts? Yeah, um, I, I would say that um, there are many opportunities through partner organizations right now, through the International Institute. Um, if you go to the International Institute's website, uh, they have a volunteer area for either um, ongoing or episodic one-time ways that you can volunteer. Um, they also um, share with many of the partners um, from Bias to uh, Welcome Neighbor to Oasis um, Ministries that there are a lot of organizations that are looking for those people who can help in different ways. Um, I will mention that the Clark Fox Foundation has ecosystem maps of different um, kinds of services in the region. And there is an ecosystem map of our immigration community that the Mosaic Project has authored. And again, it lists um, hundreds of groups. And so if you're interested in helping with health, you know, it might say Casa de Salud and others where you could help in the health community, or if you're interested in the education community or English classes, all of the groups that, that help the other area which was not come up, which I want to make a big push about, is workforce. The most important reason why people move and why immigrants move around the country, work comes first. And so finding jobs, and this is something that has not been covered in the funding mechanisms from the Institute, from refugees, or from the Welcome Fund, but workforce development is extremely important. And right now, um, the International Institute is understaffed in their ability to deal with employers. There are hundreds of employers that have said, we would love to hire these newcomers, but getting these newcomers ready, getting them in the, the workforce preparation classes at the International Institute, getting their language skills, uh, getting them back into their career paths. This takes concentrated effort. And so we as a region could use people who can help the International Institute and others of us uh, mentor people, help them with job skills, make connections for jobs because work and economic sufficiency is the most important reason why people can come and stay and be successful and attract others to move to our region. Yeah, honestly, I don't have much to add beyond what Betsy said. I think those are good resources. Um, yeah, I, I don't have much else to add. I, I mean, I, I will put in a plug. I think that the Welcome Fund, it Steve keeps well abreast of, of the developments there. So if you uh, wanna defer that and you don't feel like you know doing your research on each individual nonprofit, then uh, you know, there's some folks who can who can help direct your resources. <laughs> so, and I and I want to also remind everyone that we've talked a lot about the Afghans. We've talked a lot about um, the Ukrainian. Well, a little bit about the Ukrainians. Um, there are a lot of other refugees that are coming into the country. So, people from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Haiti, from Eritrea, from other countries south of the border. And so if you've got language skills, to be able to assist um, 
any of the organizations that are working with refugees with translation is really valuable. And um, there's some data out there about the very small number, and I can't remember what it is, but the very small number of refugees who end up having American friends, having people born and bred in the US as friends. And I think, I think that's a way that you can open up is if you've got any of those language skills to, to work with a um, welcome neighbor or Oasis International or Christian or any of or, or the International Institute, any of those that um, to to bring to help people feel welcome um, in their own language. And I would say that in addition to the um, little over 600 Afghans who have currently come, the International Institute had committed to a thousand refugees, which are through the UN refugee program. So they are certainly expecting that there might be 500 to 1,000 refugees uh, from the UN coming in, in the next um, you know, six to 12 months. And on top of that, there could be people coming from the Ukraine in the next year to three years. So um, there are many opportunities for different languages, um, Congolese that speak French, many other abilities for language and family connections uh, to help make this um, access more welcoming and smoother. Great, thank you all so much for that insight and those suggestions on how people can get involved in these efforts. I'm gonna go ahead and let everybody know that we do have about 15 minutes left for some Q&A. We had a question in the chat, Betsy, that you did answer in the chat, but I think it might be of interest to everyone on the call. Um, where have the refugees been located within our region? So typically um, when, when the International Institute resettles people, they want them to be able to get to the International Institute multiple times a week so that they can get English and, and screenings for their family for health, um, workforce assessments. And so being near the Grand Bus Line um, has been an advantage. Um, and so this is something that tends to be what happens in the beginning, but not always. And so it's been um, about 80% in the city and 20% in the county to date. Um, but over time, people do end up with jobs and transportation and cars. And just like native born people, there's often a migration out of the city into our suburban areas, um, particularly in the areas such as Afton, Bayless, where they've had a lot of our Bosnian community and they've been, um, very more welcoming to some of our Muslim communities and diversity, as well as North with Hazelwood, Pattonville, um, Rittner. So a lot of our Hispanic community has centered around Rittner who has a welcome center for Hispanic families, particularly a lot of the um, young people and families that have come from Central America have gone to a special program that's um, out at Rittner. And then our St. Louis Public Schools has um, 2,000 to 3,000 um, foreign born students through the their English second um, secondary language programs through the St. Louis Public Schools that are spread out through all of our cities. So um, there is a range. And again, that's both a strength and, and a weakness of St. Louis because we don't have like a Greek town or a Spanish town. People tend to be dispersed. Um, sometimes it relates to where they have family or friends, where there could be churches or mosques um, that are welcoming, and then where families and other volunteers help them. Um, and it also depends on housing and apartment costs and where their transportation and bus lines. And another thing that um, with some of the families that we've seen this, this year um, is that the families are larger. The families are eight, nine, 10 people. And it is harder to find housing for those large families, which is why they end up in the, in the residential hotels longer. Um, and, and oftentimes those houses are out or, or larger apartments are out um, South County. In, and, and that's, I think, why um, with this wave of, of refugees, we're seeing more um, outside the city, that 80-20. Great, thank you for that. I have not seen any more questions come through on the chat. Anybody who is here is welcome to come off mute and ask a question directly to our speakers or wonderful speakers. If there's anything we haven't touched on that you would like to add, um, we do have about 10 minutes left in the call. So feel free. Hey, Emily, um, 
we had a question um, about uh, this presentation actually being available. Uh, one of our donor families likes to meet with their group and they might like to have this presentation available. Will that be on our website? Yes, absolutely. The whole presentation was recorded. We're going to email it out and then also post it on the St. Louis Community Foundation's blog. Thank you. And I did have one final question that someone um, in the last few minutes can address other ways that um, people can get involved in the community that doesn't include, um, you know, giving money um, to one fund or another, but, you know, ways that they can get involved in terms of volunteering or other things that might be needed by this community. Yeah, I would say that the, the International Institute through their command center uh, tends to identify very specific needs. So recently, for example, they were talking about they need floor lamps because lots of the um, families go into apartments where there's no ceiling lighting. So things like they need floor lamps. Um, for these families that are now um, at, still at the extended stay hotels, they have, they have like very few clothes because people brought just uh, like a backpack. And so they need to use the uh, laundromat that's at the extended stay hotel. So they've been doing a quarter drive um, because they need quarters to use at the extended stay hotels. There are people that are cooking through the Little Angels Foundation um, to bring meals to these families um, once or twice a week that are up at the extended stay hotels. People are gathering gift cards to Schnooks and Aldi's so that these extended stay families um, can get food and cook on their kitchenettes in the um, uh, hotels uh, that they are still staying at. So th those are some very concrete things that the Institute has talked about. And I think that if you, you know, reach out to some of those people that are helping families directly, um, you will hear what those families need specifically. And, and I think that there are both tangible things as well as time that could be done. Um, One-time opportunities at the International Institute for administrative help or for teaching someone how to use the bus one time, things like that are needed as well as someone ongoing who can work with longer term um, assistance through all these partner organizations. So it's wonderful ways to help. And I, I think what people are finding that these relationships that are shared, um, that what we all learn from our newcomers is so valuable and what they learn from us is valuable. It's a two way street as we help each other. Um, and this is all part of how we make a stronger St. Louis. That's fantastic. Thank you, Betsy. And I have one question. I know this um, probably is probably a bigger issue in general, but, you know, is there, how are our educational systems or if in terms for the, you know, for kids and the families that are coming here, I mean, that's a huge part of it. Are, are is International Institute or some of our partners helping with that transition or can you just provide some insight on that? Sure. So one of the reasons why the International Institute likes to settle families in the city of St. Louis is because St. Louis Public Schools has a, um, it's actually an award-winning program for resettling, or for um, children who are um, foreign-born, and it's the Nahid Chapman Oh gosh, um, School for New America. New American Academy. Mm -hmm. New American Academy, and thank you. And um, and what they'll do is they bring in the kids and the kids are there and they're getting education, not just reading, writing and arithmetic, but also English. And then they provide some of the ESL for the families and some of the, um, like the, <clears throat> the social workers are in the schools and it, it's a really great program. But what they'll also do is they'll test where kids are in their English abilities. And there are um, several schools, I think it's two or four of the high schools and then several of the um, grade schools and middle schools in, um, in SLPS, St. Louis Public Schools, that actually do have ESL on site as well. So, so after, you know, showing up at Nahid Chapman and being tested, figuring out not only where you live, but what your English proficiency is, those kids will then go to the school that makes the best sense for them. As Betsy mentioned, um, some of the um, county districts, the Bayless District, Pattonville School District, they all um, have been really good about working together to, to support um, English language learners as they come into the into And Parkway, the um, many, many of them have really extensive programs and 
um, when young people spend um, up to two years in the Nahid Chapman New American Academy up through grade 10, they're there for up to two years um, and then they get mainstreamed out. And there's wonderful volunteer opportunities there as well as um, at the Rittner Welcome Center for people who would like to read um, and have opportunities to help um, educate these young people and support them. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for providing that information. Um, I wanted to take an opportunity to see if anyone else had any other questions for the panel. Uh, we are wrapping up now as we are coming to a close. Um, I just want to say um, I appreciate all of you for one taking your time this morning with us um, to kind of talk through the Welcome Fund and the um, individuals and families that are coming to our region as we work to be responsive as possible at the Community Foundation and with our partners and funding partners. Um, so if you don't have any additional questions, we will end this recording and this panel, but we will make this available to everyone via our email uh, if you are actually attended this um, presentation as well as on our blog and on our website. Um, again, we wanna thank you all for joining us this morning um, and we hope that you all have a great day. Thank you all.